Uh, I know the topic is super exciting. I was just telling the panelists, uh, they're very, very experienced to talk on the topic of uh, transforming ops using uh, autonomous technology. But there are quite a few of us here, so we'll make sure that a fight doesn't break out when I ask my excellent questions. <laughs> we'll keep it uh, keep it uh, uh, all, all nice and and uh, and comfy. And we also have Mo from GSK, I think, who's going to be uh, beaming in from the East Coast. Uh, yeah, but, he, but he's there. OK, wonderful. So, uh, I think the first thing I'm going to do is have the panelists actually introduce themselves and their company, their role real quickly, and then also what sort of environment they're operating in so that you get a sense of uh, what scale and size is the ops. And then we'll get into the questions. So starting with Subha. Thank you, Tim. Um, so my name is Subha Tatavarthi. I'm the global CTO of Vipro. Uh, Vipro is a global company. Uh, we operate in every continent and every country in the world. Uh, we uh, serve 1,500 plus customers, 25 plus verticals. Um, and I was just looking at some of our stats a um, couple of days ago. Uh, in terms of fleet size, we touch over a million in number of instances we operate for our customers across the globe. Um, we also manage their both uh, public and private uh, cloud environments, especially in the retail and uh, IoT um, and oil and gas. So excited to be here. Wow, that's impressive. We should talk. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Rachet. I lead product and technology for Paylocity. We are a payroll company and we move lots of money, get people paid. And the goal is to build best possible culture for every company who, who serve, we serve as our customers. We have over 35,000 customers. And in terms of technical footprint, we have over 600, 700 services powered by 30, 40,000 machines. Thank you. My name is Shishiburaj. I work for a Geodis, a third party supply chain company out of France. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, platform modernization and platform tools for Geodis Americas from North to South, including LATAM. Um, been with the company for 16 years now. Happy to be here. Thank you. And I also must call out the Shibu as the first customer of Sudai. So thank you. I'm Jigar. Uh, so currently I'm working for a company that is doing data insights. Uh, it's a startup, so we don't have a large fleet size. But I come from Facebook, so we have seen millions of machines and how to manage them. So in this talk, I'm going to talk a lot more about my Facebook experience as well. My name is Matt Duran. I'm the director of platform engineering at Nobefore. Nobefore is the provider of the world's largest uh, security awareness training and simulated phishing platform. Um, in terms of size of our environment, we have over 60,000 customers. Uh, we run anywhere from two to 4,000 containers in ECS every day of about 350 million Lambda invocations and growing every single month. Wonderful, and I can get more to introduce himself. Yeah, hi, my name is Mohammed. I am the director enterprise hosting architect uh, within GSK, uh, GlaxoSmithKline. We are a leading biopharma company. Uh, we make medicines, both general medicines, specialty medicines, and vaccines. We span 80, 000, 80 plus countries. And our aim is to positive impact about the health of 2.5 billion people by the end of 2020, 2030. So that's our aim. Uh, so that's me. And I'm really excited to be here to talk about the GSK journey on cloud and more. So, so I think uh, one of the benefits you get with a large panel is you get a variety of really amazing perspectives. And uh, I was looking up, you guys know the numbers, of course, $371 billion spent on cloud growing at 15%. Uh, 40 to 50 cents of every dollar spent, in addition, the company spent and just keep the spindle spinning at the optimal um, size and scale which is why uh, there's no way to keep this going at a, at a level of optimization if you don't run this uh, autonomous infrastructure, which is uh, the purpose of the panel. So I'm gonna start by uh, uh, zoom, like staying at a very high level, and then we'll zoom in into the practical application on how do you actually get started and what's the, what is the readiness state of the enterprise? What, what, is, what does it need to be to really adopt and get benefit because not every company when they run into uh, the notion of autonomous infrastructure are ready for it. So we're going to start with that. Uh, it's going to be very interesting uh, sort of discussion going from left to right. So um, 
uh, on Saturday when we had a conversation, I think um, uh, Shivu, you brought up this readiness idea that uh, let's let's talk about that as a launch point. So I'm going to go right to you with that question, and then we'll just have the rest of the panelists uh, jump in. So tell us about your perspective on how does anybody that is just coming into the notion of autonomous, how should they th be thinking about the readiness equation of their infrastructure? I, th I think in the keynotes uh, speech, I will see mentioned that you know it's not like a transformation doesn't come from vacuum. You know it has to be thought out uh, end to end. When we started the journey, uh, our fleet was purely a old school VM based summer AS400, those kinds of systems. So when we started the journey, uh, uh, you know, AI processes were there, but are we ready to take it and uh, utilize the full benefit of into our infrastructure was the first question. So um, we take a pause and uh, we also have another equation in the bundle that uh, where our money will be invested, including the human capital and also what is our core business we need to do with it. So our core business is in supply chain optimization and their automation is a first class citizen. You know, you have robots start, you know, picking and packing to everything we do inside the warehouse. So for a dollar, we would like to spend there. But since automation was in our DNA, when we looked into modernizing our fleet, we know we have to do automation there as well it's not like our in our because then only the customer get the full value at that process when we were talking and starting with the sadai we quickly realized that we were not mature enough to to adopt and utilize and get the benefit you can invest it because it's a newer cool technology and talk about it in presentation but that dollar spend is waste because we are not the value so that value uh, talking with the you know the people in sadai help us uncover some of the things we are not ready for. And quickly, we realized, okay, we have to invest there, either by partnering with other people who are into that, or we have to build ourselves. So that was a quick realization for us to make sure that we are ready. It doesn't mean that you have to have five years or six years, but we have to do some changes in our thinking to accept the new reality and bring the value to the business so that the dollar we spend will earn some contribution margin back to that. So the maturity on observability side, the signals which uh, I talked about in the keynote, are we ready to, do we have those signals? Do we have, uh, do we know what we have? And the ability to synthesize and use those signals. It doesn't need to be all the signals we need, at least we need some vitals. Uh, and have that ready, then partner with uh, uh, companies like Sadai and others, then you can bring the automation, its benefit, and realize that to your customers. Uh, at the same time, if you have that equation worked out very well, some of the cost things which we talked about in the previous panel will become an easy conversation because sometimes for us, the cost is not like pass through, but cost can be increased by, uh, cost can be materialized by uh, making sure that the dollar we spend get the benefit via efficiency improvement the different variables which we talked about in the previous panel. So it's key that we are we are ready uh, to to digest what some of these technologies are bringing in. So the maturity on observability and key signals is really key for you to be successful. Anybody else like to contribute? Yeah, I know we are compressed on time. I have a long answer. I don't know. It's all good. <laughs> You've got all the time. So I, I love the answer and the question and the approach overall. Let me extend what he just shared. As people, it's very easy for us to think in terms of framework, right? We always, if we have a guideline, a framework, it helps us think about what is the journey and where do we want to be? Uh, the car industry is going to the same thing. So they come up with this beautiful framework, L0 to L5, and it tells you where you are in the terms of maturity, right? L0 is you have no driver assistance. L1 is you start with the assistance and then you get partial assistance, conditional assistance, full assistance, and then autonomous. It takes a while for you to go from L0, which is driving a beat up Hyundai, to driving a Tesla, which has someone, whoever, right? It's, that has a fully autonomous system. In operations, it's the exact same thing. If you walk into an environment at L0, that means every host is handcrafted. There is no automation. 
you name the host and you go, yeah, do you know, do you remember Alpine or do you remember 10.20.31, right? Throwing out random IPs. That is not, you cannot talk about autonomous there. So what do you do? You invest in technology and you embrace IIAC, which is infrastructure as code. You go to the next level. Now you have infrastructure as code, what do you do? You install in, or you provide instrumentation with tools like Ansible, control tower, so that we can run commands at scale. You go to, you've graduated to the next level, right? Which is partial assistance. And then to the next level, which is where you start to in, uh, observe conditions, which is advanced observability as, as you touched on it. And then the next level is when you embrace things like mesh, where you're automatically controlling the system. Now you have a fully automated system. The next step is autonomous, where you leave the system and let it decide what is the best for my customers. It takes a while. It takes a while to go from L1 or L0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 and 5. Fifth is the autonomous state, right? So these are the steps that are required. And each step is, has, has its own tooling, implementation, and the metric, the success criteria that you would look at. Oh, anything to add from your side from GSK? No, I think I think uh, very nicely stated uh, by the first gentleman. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so even for our journey, the same thing, right? It's a it's a process for us. So you talked about first and foremost the good thing for us. Uh, the good thing from GSK perspective was we adopted cloud, right? So so there was no confusion in our mind that they are not API driven. So infrastructure code, someone talked about, absolutely highly important, from code to deployment to runtime to monitoring. Then from a monitoring perspective, very important to us is three things. It's just not performance, uh, it's security. And then third part is highly important is financial because now that we go to the cloud, optimize it as people have journey, been a three year journey, now as people have started adopting cloud, it's all about cost, performance and security. So how do we take that together? As someone was mentioning the last stage, how do we take that together and do the right, right sizing is the biggest challenge we see today. Uh, and hopefully, people like Sadai can solve the problem for us. And that's why we are here. So, so those are the three things. So that's highly important for us. Yeah. I have a perspective I wanted to share. Um, and this is like my journey over three different companies. I think Sri covered a lot about uh, PayPal. And there, we were going through transformation, right? So we had people staring at screens, um, you know, worrying about every machine, what's going on to automation and, and, and this autonomous systems that we built. And we had to take some time because it was not just a technology change, it was a culture change, where we had to get people along with us and not just abandon them saying, hey, you don't know, and we're going to do actually work for you. And the journey was tough. So that was like my uh, sort of PayPal journey on how to become ready, not just from a technology perspective, but also from people and culture perspective. Then I went to Facebook and the uh, mindset was completely different. We were doubling in size in terms of machines, and I'm talking about millions of machines right. every year. So readiness was not a word in our dictionary. You better be ready because machines are coming. Um, so very different approach where uh, culturally we were ready to take on any challenges because we were seeing that growth uh, for a longer time. And then with Sisu, that's the startup that I am in, uh, mindset is very different. So very first day when we started building system, we had autonomous as a principle because we didn't have enough people to uh, build system that can be looked upon by folks staring at screens. So autonomous system was built as a ground up and something like Sedai, you can actually start using on day one, even for a smaller startup. Right. So I think readiness is very different for which, which state of the journey you are in. Right. Uh, and, and you have to behave very differently depending upon your needs. Yeah, I think, uh, Jika, you touched upon something interesting because it's exactly what we observe across the board because of the kind of maturity we see across our customer base. Um, the, the readiness um, per se and assessment of readiness is absolutely critical. As an example, one of our largest uh, device medical device manufacturers based out of Japan, uh, we manage their uh, data center and infrastructure. It's one of the customers. Um, introducing said I would not even be an option for us because right now they are all bare metal. They are sitting in their own data centers and they're not even virtualized in some cases, actually in most cases. So I guess I'm just double clicking on that, which is the readiness part uh, is absolutely critical. 
So that's a really interesting point, Jigar, that you made. And I'm going to pick on Matt and ask him a question. So sounds like some companies are just born, just to use your, uh, you know, your, your uh, L1 to L5, born on L4, leaning into L5, perhaps, and you can just adopt it. And you were at scale, uh, Matt, in terms of the lambdas you were using. Looks like you were already L5, as in you had everything internally. Is that is that uh, am I sort of uh, reaching out too far, or would you say where were you on that on that maturation journey? Because sitting at the board of Sadai, I was I was getting the updates from uh, the team. I was quite impressed with how quickly you were able to make the decision and deploy and start getting value uh, end to end with the with the platform. Yeah, you know, I think it's a really good assessment of where we are. It's not something that that just happened to us. Um, it was something that we had to be very deliberate in order to achieve. So I started at Noble 4 in 2018, and my boss, who's the SVP of platform engineering, started just a year before. Um, he was the first SRE at the company. And at that time, most of our software was running on EC2 instances. Uh, including databases, including compute. In many cases, it was a you know single server that was processing and providing a lot of what we delivered to our customers. And our job originally as the SRE team was to clean that up while the Amazon bill was still four or five figures a month, you know, 8,000, 10,000, something really low like that. Yeah. And if we hadn't have gone through that journey when we did, it would be significantly harder now that our Amazon commit next year is, you know, uh, more than millions and millions of dollars. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think it's really, it really speaks to, you know, how easy it was for us to implement Sedai because we were strong users of infrastructure as code. We had all worked in different environments and different size companies before that had varying you know, levels of implementation of IAC, lots of experience with, you know, common tools like like CloudFormation. We actually chose to use Terraform. And it's not even a metric that we track, you know, how much of our infrastructure is Terraformed, but it's high 90s in terms of percent. So, and, and then the compute side, Lambda and ECS, it's at the 100% level. And in the time that it took us to sign up with Sedai and, you know, get from zero to 100% with them. Uh, it was just a matter of months because of that. Got it. So may maybe more broadly, and this is a question, and I'll, I could see a show of hands from the room as a affirmation or not. The people in this room are very much left of the chasm, right? So we are the believers. We think autonomous needs to happen, but there's a small set of us that really believe it. And I think it's the people in this room that have to sort of force the industry to realize the benefits and move to the right of the chasm. And the question is, what I'm sensing is that there's no agreed upon framework that talks to the maturation of a, of a company where you could say, hey, I'm L2 right now. If I do these three things, I'll be L3. And then I'll, at L4, I can start adopting. So the first question to the open uh, room is, do you believe a uh, show of hands would be a yes, that the industry needs some sort of a framework which lets it quickly test where on the journey it is in terms of readiness to adopt uh, autonomous frameworks. Okay, that's a super high hit rate. Now, the second question is whose job is it to define this framework? Do you think it's Sadai's job? Do you think it's Gartner and Sadai? Do you think it's these, these great customers that are already starting to benefit from? But where does this come from? Because Clearly, it's needed. Any, any, and then, if you don't have a mic, just uh, speak loudly. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat. But where does this come from? Because I'd love next year to be able to stand up here and say that we have a framework in place, and companies start referring to that framework because it's all makes it more easy to sell up and down the management chain. Yep. So, to maybe I'll, I'll start first. Jump in, since um, I you have lots of customers to take care of yes um i think it depends um the frameworks it's it's at least so far it's very hard to standardize on a framework like such given how fragmented the 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 stack as well as the usage and the implications and the uh, and the applications are so so i think and at least from what we have seen so far, uh, it has to be 
a combination of that vertical. Okay, there's another data point there, which is every vertical stack is very different. Um, this has been a huge revelation. I've been here with for two and a half years, and um, a medical device manufacturing has a very different composition of our water stack looks like versus an IoT versus a retail versus a manufacturer versus uh, a company like eBay, uh, sorry, PayPal versus Walmart, etc. Um, so I think it has to be um, a generic enough, but it won't then be solving the problem. It has to be coming from the customer in consultation with somebody like Sadai, who has a maturity, who has a general understanding of how the system works and also has the collective intelligence of implementations across these verticals, and perhaps hopefully a company like Wipro. Got it. Slightly different perspective, though I agree I with I love you. it. I told you if the panel is big, the fight's about to break up. Here's an example. <laughs> <That's just good. laughs> it's not a fight. <laughs> I, I, I do. I, <laughs> I slightly disagree with There we go. <laughs> now we're talking. It's the afternoon, guys. We got to wake up the audience. All right, let's go. <laughs> so in technology, it's less about the what, it's more about the how, right? The hows are pretty standard. We don't have a lot of options. So when you walk into a data center, if you're naming your host with IPs or specific names, you know what the maturity is. Right. The next step usually is automate this part. Once you automate that part, you graduate to the next level. Ways to automate are very limited. And your key metrics that will come out of it, again, you know what, what that number is. right? So that is how the framework would be agnostic to what industry you're from or what is the outcome that you're looking at. So, and then as you go up the stacks, so the step one usually is infrastructure as code. You, you embrace that one, which is driver assist. So you have assistance now, right? You can look at somebody's code and go right or wrong. The next one is uh, partial assistance. So something is broken somewhere. I should be able to run a command without understanding the know-how about the system. This is where you introduce tools like Ansible or Control Tower or something else, right? Which becomes essentially the brain of your infrastructure. And then the next step usually is around more instrumentation, where you start to gather more and more input, more signals. You introduce tools like Datadog or uh, more observability tool stack so that you can drive better decisions. And then after that, it's usually tools like Mesh, which can route your traffic. Being a little proactive around what could go wrong. I see this host running hot. You, and I, I skip one step, which is around scaling up and scaling down. You don't, you're not using traffic, you shut down your boxes, but you cannot do that in level zero because everything is stateful, right? And then the, the penultimate is around mesh controlling your traffic. Traffic comes here, mesh says, oh, this is running hot, I'll move here without human assistance. The last step is autonomous. Yeah. Tools like SIDI become a catalyst. They can help you jump from L3 to L5 without doing all that hard work. And that is the magic of the solution, right? So I completely agree with you, my friend, except for L0 to L1. L0 to L1, same story. No, we'll have our chat offline. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 please. <laughs> jump in there. We'll yeah. <laughs> is there a bar after this? <laughs> okay, just checking. <laughs> you, need, you wanted me here for a reason. Uh, yes, yes. Go ahead, Matt. So I'll definitely join the fight a little bit and say, no, nobody in this room is is at is at L zero, and I, I think the the barrier there is you know even goes back to the introduction of centralized logging um, and, and collection of data from these decentralized systems, and you know if you if you really think about it, you, you could get from from L zero or L one to L5 with, without, you know, ever using a tool like Sedai. And I, I like the point that, you know, it's an accelerant, but, you know, you could, you could get to that L5 level with some carefully tailored bash scripting, right? If, if you had this algorithmic approach to automation and to autonomous, you could absolutely get there with a way that was very tailored to your environment. But I, I almost want to introduce this idea of, of L6 where having a, you, you have this, this AI driven system that's discovering things that, you know, engineers or humans may have never even conceived, may have never even thought of. 
Um, so I don't, I don't think that, you know, no before is, is at L6 yet. Um, in some cases we're definitely not even at L5, but the places where we're using SID I, I think are so much more advanced than the places that we're not. And it really feels like almost a, a new tier, a new level of automation is actually needed to be defined. So, um, that's been a really cool journey for us this year. And, you know, we're looking forward to see how much stuff we can get to L5 and beyond, you know, in the future. Yeah, Tim, I, I will just, uh, I don't want to add fuel into the fight, but I'll agree with <laughs> Shiva on this one. The reason is uh, there are many times we talk about this, we talk about institutions which are very software technology oriented, but for example, there is no place in Ansible for a PLC or a conveyor system. I cannot bring up a conveyor system by running a script. It's not going to happen. So it depends upon the industry also. that, And each industry, uh, if you carefully look at it, there is a story for tools like Sedai. So that's what also I, the perspective of maturity comes into play. The, we cannot just define uh, that maturity or the framework just by looking at sure. a technology powerhouse like Google's or the eBay's. There are other industries, yeah, but vertical, yeah. verticals and industries, which can utilize this. Yeah. So that's where it comes into play. Super uh, interesting dialogue. So I'd like to uh, now switch to the approach. And when I talk about the approach, I want to ask uh, uh, Matt, starting with you, and then we'll go to more uh, GSK. Uh, and, and what is the right approach to implement autonomous systems and talk particularly to the risk side of the equation. We know all the benefits. How did you mitigate risk? And this conversation came up on Saturday when we were chatting as well. And, and after you two go, maybe the rest of the panelists can uh, chime in on how they think about risk mitigation. Because uh, I do remember that guy from your presentation. Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with him? Yeah, I, I think m my biggest answer is if, if you're completely risk averse, you're going to be stuck lower on, on a level of, you know, autonomous, there, there's always going to be some risk that, you know, you have to accept as an engineering leader or, or as an organization. And we take those kinds of risks every day. And so, like you said, it was just a matter of making that a low risk instead of a high risk, something that was small enough that, that we were willing to accept it. And, I think for us, a lot of the building blocks for that were sort of already in place. You know, we, we had this infrastructure that was well-defined by Terraform and modules that were already centralized so that we knew 90 something percent of all of our compute was being delivered by just a, a handful of, of Terraform modules that made it really easy for us to plug into that. You know, they, they were also pulling our latest version of the module. So we didn't have to go through hundreds or thousands of repos and update to, you know, a new pinned version of that module or something like that. Um, we were already taking risks by doing that, by trying to be more uh, closer to the edge, you know, in, in that way. Um, so I think what I would say, if you are looking to implement more automation and more autonomy in what you're doing, find ways where you can approach the edge, find places, whether it's specific services or environments or whatever it may be for you and for your industry and vertical, where you're willing to take some kind of risk, where you're willing to, you know, pull the latest version of a package that's internally managed, that's internally created, um, or find some other place where you can implement, you know, SIDI or, or tools like it in a way that, if they had problems, you know, you could roll back quickly. Um, you know, you, you could, you could tolerate a little bit of, of an issue or downtime if it were to happen. Was, is one way to uh, mitigate that is to start with, I don't know, 20% autonomous and then kind of scale your way up. Cause I don't exactly recall, but you went to hundred percent very quickly. Yeah, we, we did once we were ready, you know, and, and we didn't start at zero and go to a hundred overnight. Sure. Um, we, we sort of tailor picked a service that we knew would would get some good utilization in, in production. Um, it was a service that we knew was going to lead to marketing and, and PR releases and, and some buzz. Uh, even as a beta feature, we had, you know, I think hundreds of customers that were testing and using this feature while we had Sedai enabled on it. 
And we had we enabled Sedai throughout the entire process of building this new feature. So it was a net new feature in the product. It was some new services behind the scenes. We went ahead and while they were in the development cycles, implemented Sedai you know, early on there for them. So engineers that were working on you know that service team didn't really know anything was happening. Um, we moved on from there and pretty much flipped that flag, turned it on for all of our development environments. After we had seen a production service go through an entire release cycle, live in prod for a number of weeks, and really just see cost savings and not see any sort of issues. So at that point, you know, once once we had seen it running for you know weeks to months in production and in development, and had seen nobody asking what happened to this service, why did this scale down? Why did this scale up? Why did these resources change? I didn't do it. Um, you know, then we were, we felt pretty confident to kind of open the floodgates, if you will. And Mo, how about yourself at uh, in Pharma Land, one of the largest pharma companies uh, in the world? How are you thinking about the journey and the implementation? So I, I, I think I, I'll, I'll talk about our journey, right? So for us, the most important thing is we said we can't do all these beautiful things if you're in the data center. So cloud adoption was the highest thing, right? We've, we've got Azure and GCP. So that's how we started adopting, right? API, infrastructure code, everything that's stack driven, whether research wants to do drug discovery faster, whether they want to do yield improvement in supply chain. And absolutely completely agreed, level two and below, there's no way how you can automate. Okay. I'm completely agree with Subrat there. And then the third part of, of is how do we sell faster with market data, right? So the cloud provided us enough of the API automation from code all the way in. But we were not restricted. Like, for example, if I take Sedai, they do a particular job in containers. Now, the number of services we turn on within the cloud is human. We have 40 plus services because it's all about innovation. We are a very data engineer, very, very data focused company. So, a lot of our data services there. So, when you talk about risk, if you put the appropriate guardrails, have appropriate people, people, of course, who can manage and operate that, who understand the technology really well and understand the business really well. That's how these services were turned on and got accommodated. But now, today, in the cloud, whether if you use Sedai or no Sedai, there are ways, for example, if I use Azure Advisor, I'm giving an example as an Azure Advisor, it does provide you enough information for you to do manually. You can go in and say, I can start, stop, I can do certain things, modification, I can do a different life cycle of storage, right? All those can be done, and we currently, our customers do it manually with the right, because they understand the applications really well. And, and, and we have built right amount of guardrail. We started with dev environment, then we started with non-prod, and then production so far we've not done enough. But dev and non-prod is where we started playing around and doing these kind of things. And as I said, our customers are a little bit more mature. We have a three-year journey in the cloud. Hence, they already are there. We have a chargeback mechanism, so they do see that. So the next step in their mind is, how do I save cost? How can I become an autonomous system where I can take data from, as I said, to currently performance. That means you have to really understand what the application is doing. And second part is how do I really get, uh, how do I marry that with financial operation data, FinOps data, which we have different tools. How do I bring them together and allow the cusp and aut autonomously do these things is a risk. But as I said, we are from a risk part where we'll start with dev. That's my guard rate. That's our guard rate. That's where we'll start doing these things. And as we mature, as we learn, We'll push it to non-product production. That's a journey from a risk averse journey. So we do mitigate risk. We don't put everything in production. We start from a sandbox, figure it out to dev, promote it. So we do classic promotion before we do anything on. So even if autonomous system will follow the same principles, put the right guardrails, put the right thing, just like we do for things like AI today, open AI engine, uh, LLMs and all that. We definitely do that from sandbox and we do. So there is way to risk, especially we being a highly regulated staff, risk. We don't take too much risk, but we put the right security controls, automate all the security controls using infrastructure code, policy as a code, whatever you want to say, and try to promote it. So, but we still haven't gone to a complete autonomous journey. Hopefully we'll get there in the next couple of years. So, but again, as I told you, we, we deal with everything. We deal with containers. We have a big container. We deal with virtual machines. We deal with storages. We deal with every known ETL processes that runs in the, in the cloud. So, in our case, there is 
how how does the framework work? So back to you. One, one more question I have is how does your framework work in all these cloud services? How do we do this? How do we do an autonomous system is kind of a bit of a challenge for us because everyone does specific things really, really well for us today in the autonomous. Uh, like Sadai does a pretty good job on containers. They do a fantastic job. So now if I do virtual machines, if I migrate, how do I do those things? So those things have to be thought through also uh, from a complete autonomous system, from a pure infrastructure. It's easy when people say you can build a stack, but your stack is okay as long as your VMs. But if your stack is like this, horizontal, then you got to think through everything in a more granular fashion. So Right, right. Any other comments to add? I, I wanted to add a couple of comments. So my experience, and I think I'm kind of double down on guardrails concept. Um, and this was my experience at Facebook that we had a lot of automation and our systems were autonomous. And at some point in time, somebody was able to push a change on a network to the entire network. And we brought the entire internet, like we were disconnected from the internet for several hours, right? So blast radius with, this level of automation is pretty high. So to most point, you need to have enough guardrails. And I think I would also add another point, which I think uh, you mentioned that we need to treat infrastructure code as code. Like if you're developing an application, you're not pushing your code to production without testing. So how do you actually bring discipline of de development and testing to infrastructure code so that there is a uh, environment where you can play with these changes before you push it to production. You are actually doing release in a controlled manner. I think these are some of the discipline that you can actually adopt to make sure your risk factor is much lower with, you know, uh, especially with the infrastructure changes. Got it. Got it. I'm going to transition to uh, the, um, I think the prior panel talked about the financial impact, positive financial impact of going autonomous, but there's the non uh, or the qualitative aspects of going autonomous. And that's part of the value you, you seek to derive uh, from the, the application of this technology. Things like, you know, obviously uh, customer sat, employee empowerment, the triangle that I think Sri showed where, you know, the shiny bit on the top is what you're spending your most time on and the crud at the bottom, you're reducing that. So I'd love to hear uh, from the panel, uh, anybody can start. Uh, what are some of those non-financial gains that you were able to trap and then communicate to the rest of the organization, uh, which made the basis for the success, the internal success for uh, and the, sale, the sellability of that uh, once you adopted Autonomous? I can share. Yep. Set the foundation and you can disagree. <laughs> <laughs> so. We are at a precipice when it comes to innovation, especially in the autonomous space. We have the right tools, we have the right environment, we just need the right actors now. We saw this similar story at Netflix around 2013, 2014, 2015, when the, the culture in the industry was you are your dev, your ops, dev does the build, ops would deploy it and maintain the infrastructure. Netflix came along and said, you know what? This does not work for me. I want to move faster. We built systems in there that will help people deploy more and more artifacts to production. The outcome of that, the experimentation went up by 6,000%. We were doing two, three, four experiments a month that changed to over 1,000 experiments a day. The result of which people got hooked up to Netflix. They loved Netflix. Not because there was something, someone really smart sitting behind the screens, figuring out what buttons to put where, what movies to put there. No, it was an autonomous system making decisions on what can go forward, what cannot, right? So devs felt more comfortable rolling out PRs. Every single PR was ready for production. If it was not ready, the system would block it and say, nope, you're not ready. That was an autonomous, autonomous system making decisions. We're seeing the same thing happening in production now. As companies grow, traffic volumes grow, it becomes very hard for us to hire more and more people because that's unjustifiable. Right? If I come to you and say, I need 40 more people to run more infrastructure, you'd be like, what are you doing? Yeah. This is not efficient, efficient, this is not effective. But if you put an autonomous system there that helps you figure out what are the right things to do, your customers are happier. Your people are happier because they don't have to focus on the mundane tasks. They can focus on more intellectual, heavy tasks, more contextual driven. And on top of that, the, the dependent teams, it frees up all of their time. So companies who would start to embrace autonomous now 
would see more innovation, more disruption. They'll be able to move faster because this is how R&D allocations work. There are companies out there with 100, like 100 plus millions of in R&D, but 80, 90% goes towards run the business. Yeah. BAU, you're spending nothing on innovation. This helps you unlock those dollars, divert them back to the actual growth of the business, back to the top line, not just keeping us alive. We've seen that in the past with other things, and now it's happening with operations. So it's, it's extremely exciting. I agree with you. All right. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Validation is always good. Okay. Just because you said, no, seriously. Um, so what we've been doing uh, at Pepro is, um, so with Gen AI, it's going to impact uh, a lot of what we do. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of operations, we have 250,000 employees globally. And a lot of our cost it goes into this employee base. Um, in addition to the $12 billion we make uh, on services, there's 450 million ARR revenue from platforms. So to your point, uh, we had to create constraints or starve the RTB. Um, and so there is ruthless prioritization on RTB take that savings out and invest in our own internal uh, core, AI, we call that core AI platform. This is essentially it's a Gen AI platform we we're orchestrating across multiple models, including some of the models that are being, being built internally by our R&D team, which are specific around say, um, I mean, obviously some models are better at uh, text to voice, others are better at images and so on and so forth. And we just released, uh, we're doing beta release. We have more than 5,000 employees and we are driving in addition to the RTB reduction, we're also driving uh, more gains on other um, uh, use cases, starting from HR. As an example, for us, um, HR and back, I know it's not about autonomy and infrastructure, but it's related and kind of the principle. Uh, it used to take, I mean, it's a people-based business, at least it was, it was, and it continues to be today, but in the future, hopefully not. Um, and uh, most of our cost goes in background checks and hiring. So it used to take seven to 10 days for us to do background checks, and now it's literally a couple of hours. So that productivity gains reduces the time to uh, onboard and also the total cost of onboarding for right. employees is an example, and that is giving additional savings. So, yes. I wanted to add a couple of points. Uh, first one, I think there is people happiness. There is employee happiness. And I see companies that have adopted um, automation, deployed autonomous systems, I've seen employees being happier there. They're able to attract good talent because people want to work for companies where they can spend time on what they want to do rather than just doing run the business or keeping the lights on. So I think it can become a great tool to attract good talent. And that's the reason why Google and Facebook are able to attract the best of the talent because most of the work is not mundane work. That's the work you're spending doing creative work to Sri's point where he highlighted this pyramid. The second part is I think the automation can also be business enabler. And, and I've seen it personally many times that some of the complex business ask may be solved by automation. Uh, we went through that at my uh, current startup where there is a company in, in, in Europe and they are going through a bunch of regulations and they are saying, we need deployment in London uh, or we are not actually boarding on your, or on your uh, platform. And because we had automation, we could actually spin up a new instance, completely new instance just for them and serve them there. So I see that this is just one example, but there are many examples where your investment in automation can actually help grow business as well. So it's not, not cost, cost saving, but I think it's much more than that. Uh, and in some cases, it can actually grow your business significantly. And I've seen it at, at least a few places where this has happened. Super. Um, we have about nine minutes to go, and I want to switch to some topics that came up on, on Saturday when we were chatting, which were really interesting ideas where the autonomous platform of Sedai could go. Not that the engineering team needs no more, more work, but uh, Benji, uh, get your pen ready. Um, these guys had some really creative things that they were thinking of. So I'll just open up the floor to uh, give ideas on where do you think the technology can go? What is that You know, 6L6 you talked about? Uh, what are some of the things that could come from like the next phase of value, right? Bunch of deployed um, 
uh, Gen AI uh, powered uh, autonomous systems and, and, and scale out infrastructure. All eyes on you, man. Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said this on the call on Zoom, so you guys should step up. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to I'm going to not directly answer that question, but just kind of talk about the the approach that I kind of immediately go to when you start thinking about that sort of stuff is where are my cost centers? You know, and if, if I take our company is 100 percent, you know, AWS cloud native, um, which, uh, you know, for the panel up here may be a little unique and we have some things in AWS that cost a, a ton, a ton of money. Um, you know, and I, I think that Lambda functions and containers are a really, really logical place for Sedai to have started. You know, they, they have knobs that can be turned really easily. They have sliders that can be, you know, moved up and down without, from what we've seen, without affecting the customer's experience or, or by making it better or significantly better. Um, and you start to look at other services in the cloud and, you know, then even moving to, to on-premise or to multi-cloud environments and it becomes a lot more difficult. So uh, as a customer, I, I would love for some solutions to my ever increasing cloud front spend that just goes up, up, up every time we get more customers um, or to, you know, Aurora or RDS spend or S3 spend where, you know, you sort of have these unbounded, um, or provisioned environments that, you know, oh, it could continue to grow as we get more customers, or I've defined a specific, you know, backend data store to be this specific size and changing that means downtime for my customers, right? So once you kind of push the border of the compute pieces in, in a cloud, uh, it becomes very difficult and it, it, it's going to require some, you know, I think more creative solutions um, not all of which are, are, you know, immediately obvious. And if, if you try and sit and think, how would I do that with RDS? I don't know. I don't know. Please. Uh, for, for us from a non-technology based organization, I would say probably taking tools like Sadai to the edge, for example, each of our warehouses, uh, if you look at by IP addresses, each warehouse has probably 10,000s of IP addresses dealing with we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, and uh, just to give you an example, when a box moves from one conveyor, even a space of a extra centimeter adds money to all that because we want that spacing to be as much as possible but not touching so that the scanners can do it. So um, a version of or a scale down uh, Sedai, which is only looking at few automation signals. You know, it's not like uh, we just may need to restart some services before it happens, like six hour reboot cycles we were talking about. Because if a conveyor goes down, uh, to bring it back, it takes another two, three hours. So if you can reduce that to the edge, because every edge is a mini data center for us. Yeah. How can we do that without the old sophistication we are talking about? We just need L2 so that someone you know, sparks the battery again so things will move. That will give us more benefit because for us, labor is a huge cost. Right. If a conveyor goes down, the entire employee base, which is 4,000 picking and packing, will stay put. It takes two hours to get back. On a minimum wage, you multiply, that's a cost. Right. Uh, so if you can take a version of Sadai to the edge, because we are seeing value in our data centers and the cloud. So if you can take that to the edge, you know the proposition becomes a little bit different. So hand go back, uh, raise it in the back. I think I think Suresh got that. <laughs> so um, no, go ahead, Jiga. No, that's okay. Okay. Um, so I think one of the areas where we're at least when we're orchestrating across LLMs, we're noticing um, the precision. Right. It's a it's a combination of the the scope or the how how wide the the applicability is and the need for precision. And in use cases like Sedai and infrastructure, you need higher precision. So. Um, one of the trends that we are observing is uh, training uh, transformer ba architecture based or the next, next iteration of transformer architecture based uh, models on specific data sets. Um, and this is an area I think I said I can potentially grow significantly, which is create LLM like or transformer like models for um, the infrastructure space. It depends on the kinds of data you see. So I think there is a massive space there. And, and, and I think others may not be able to play so much. 
is actually a related question that uh, John just handed me, directed at Jigger. I'll just read it. Came from an online viewer. It said, in an LLM and Gen, I, Gen AI world, infra stacks are going to be rethought. Workloads are CPU, GPU hybrids. What are the autonomous opportunities in this realm? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there is a lot to be done. Um, if you look at a typical Gen AI life cycle, or even if you don't take Gen AI, but just looking machine learning life cycle, there are literally three phases. There is one phase of data cleaning and data preparation. So I was so happy to see that SEDA is going to handle data platforms because it's a significant part of cost. And there's a lot of optimization opportunities in just data prep space. There's a second part of it is how do you train the models, right? So whether you take a Gen AI model, which is uh, LLM, uh, which is available to you on open source, or you're developing your own model, training is super expensive. So you're working on thousands of GPUs or you're kind of using thousands of GPUs on cloud, super expensive. And by the way, uh, the way we use resources for training models is probably a decade behind how we use the production resources. All those techniques and optimizations have not been applied uh, on how to optimize GPU usage. And then the last phase is how do you serve it, right? The inference. Inference is a massive cost. I think somebody was just mentioning that GPT 3.5 versus 4, there is a different cost. I think it was Sri mentioning that. And uh, there is a massive opportunity to actually trim down the models so that you don't have to serve this giant models mm -hmm. as inference. So there is an opportunity, which I generally call it as an ML op space, right from data preparation to training the model to serving the model. Uh, and said, I, I can, can become a billion dollar business by kind of handling this new wave of things that is going on. Thank you. That was great. Um, I think we're at time, maybe a couple of more minutes. So happy to take any more questions from online or uh, from the, the room. Johnny, questions? Do you have anything from online? Um, that, was, uh, that was all we asked about. One minute. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sure you sat through a lot of panels and you always evaluate them on a two by two axis, which is content and entertainment. So this one pegs it on both. Thank you very much. <laughs>